Hi there, friend. Welcome back. Now we've found another safe place for refuge while we can read the next chapter of Frankenstein. I think this place looks safe enough. We have not yet encountered the demon ourselves, but perhaps that's for the best. Let's continue our reading of the book, and hopefully we can get out of here very soon. This is chapter 15, and as previously, the demon was recounting his experience in gaining an understanding of the world, and showing us his motives. Such was the history of my beloved cottages. It impressed me deeply. I learned from the views of social life which it developed to admire their virtues and appreciate the vices of mankind. As yet I looked upon crime as a distant evil, and benevolence and generosity were ever present before me, inciting within me a desire to become an actor in the busy scene where so many admirable qualities were called forth and displayed. But in giving account of the progress of my intellect, I must not omit a circumstance which occurred in the beginning of the month of August of the same year. One night, during my accustomed visit to the neighbouring wood, where I collected my own food and brought home firing for my protectors, I found on the ground a leathern portmanteau containing several articles of dress and some books. I eagerly seized the prize and returned with it to my hovel. Fortunately, the books were written in the language, the elements of which I had acquired at the cottage. They consisted of Paradise Lost a volume of Plutarch's Lives and the Sorrows of Water. The possession of these treasures gave me extreme delight. I now continually studied and exercised my mind upon these histories, whilst my friends were employed in their ordinary occupations. I can hardly describe to you the effect of these books. They produced in me an infinity of new images and feelings that sometimes raised me to ecstasy, but more frequently sunk me into the lowest dejection. In the sorrows of Werther, besides the interest of its simple and affecting story, so many opinions are canvassed, and so many lights are thrown upon what had hitherto been to me obscure subjects that I found in it a never-ending source of speculation and astonishment. The gentle and domestic manners it described combined with lofty sentiments and feelings which had for their object something out of self accorded well with my experience among my protectors and with the wants which were forever alive in my own bosom but i thought were to himself a more divine being than i had ever beheld or imagined his character contained no pretension, but it sank deep. The disquisitions upon death and suicide were calculated to fill me with wonder. I did not pretend to enter into the merits of the case, yet I inclined towards the opinions of the hero whose extinction I wept without precisely understanding it. As I read, however, I applied much personally to my own feelings and condition. I found myself similar, yet at the same time strangely unlike to the beings concerning whom I read, and to whose conversation I was a listener. I sympathized with and partly understood them, but I was unformed in mind. 
I was dependent on none, and related to none. The path of my departure was free, and there was none to lament my annihilation. My person was hideous, and my stature gigantic. What did this mean? Who was I? What was I? Where did I come? What was my destination? These questions continually recurred, but I was unable to solve them. The volume of Plutarch's lives which I possessed contained the histories of the first founders of the ancient republics. This book had a far different effect upon me from the sorrows of Werther. I learned from Werther's imaginations, despondency, and gloom, but Plutarch taught me high thoughts. He elevated me above the wretched sphere of my own reflections to admire and love the heroes of past ages. Many things I read surpassed my understanding and experience. I had a very confused knowledge of kingdoms, wide extents of country, mighty rivers, and boundless seas, but I was perfectly unacquainted with towns and large assemblages of man. The cottage of my protectors had been the only school in which I had studied human nature, but this book developed new and mightier scenes of action. I read of men concerned in public affairs, governing or massacring their species. I felt the greatest ardour for virtue rise within me, an abhorrence for vice, as far as I understood the signification of these terms, relative as they were, as I applied them to pleasure and pain alone. Induced by these feelings, I was, of course, led to admire peaceable lawgivers, Numa, Solon, and Lysurgus, in preference to Romulus and Theseus. The patriarchal lives of my protectors caused these impressions to take a firm hold on my mind. Perhaps if my first introduction to humanity had been made by a young soldier, burning for glory and slaughter, I should have been imbued by different sensations. But paradox lost, excited, different, and far deeper emotions. I read it as I had read the other volumes which had fallen into my hands as a true history. It moved every feeling of wonder and awe that the picture of an omnipotent god warring with his creatures was capable of exciting. I often referred the several situations of their similarity struck me to my own. Like Adam, I was apparently united by no link to any other being in existence, but his state was far different from mine in every other respect. He had come forth from the hands of God, a perfect creature, happy and prosperous, guarded by the especial care of his creator. He was allowed to converse with and acquire knowledge from beings of a superior nature. But I was wretched, helpless, and alone. Many times I considered Satan as the fitter emblem of my condition. For often, like him, when I reviewed the bliss of my protectors, the bitter gall of envy rose within me. Another circumstance strengthened and confirmed these feelings. Soon after my arrival in the hovel, I discovered some papers in the pocket of the dress which I had taken from your laboratory. At first I had neglected them, but now that I was able to decipher the characters in which they were written, I began to study them with diligence. It was your journal of the four months that preceded my creation. You minutely described in these papers every step you took in the progress of your work. This history was mingled with accounts of domestic occurrences. You doubtless recollect these papers. Here they are. 
Everything is related in them which bears a reference to my accursed origin. The whole detail of that series of disgusting circumstances which produced it is set in view. The minutest description of my odious and loathsome person is given in language which painted your own horrors and rendered mine indelible. I sickened as I read. Hateful day when I received life, I exclaimed in agony. Accursed creator, why did you form a monster so hideous that even you turned from me in disgust? God in pity made man beautiful and alluring after his own image, but my form is a filthy type of yours, more horrid even from the very resemblance. Satan had his companions, fellow devils, to admire and encourage him, but I am solitary and abhorred. These were the reflections of my hours of despondency and solitude, but when I contemplated the virtues of the cottagers, their amiable and benevolent dispositions, I persuaded myself that when they should become acquainted with my admiration of their virtues, they would compassionate me and overlook my personal deformity. Could they turn from their door one, however monstrous, who solicited their compassion and friendship? I resolved at least not to despair, but in every way to fit myself for an interview with them which would decide my fate. I postponed this attempt for some months longer for the importance attached to its success inspired me with a dread lest I should fail. Besides, I found that my understanding improved so much with every day's experience that I was unwilling to commence this undertaking until a few more months should have added to my sagacity. Several changes in the meantime took place in the cottage. The presence of Safi diffused happiness among its inhabitants, but I also found that a greater degree of plenty reigned there. Felix and Agatha spent more time in amusement and conversation, and were assisted in their labours by servants. They did not appear rich, but they were contented and happy. Their feelings were serene and peaceful, while mine became every day more tumultuous. Increase of knowledge only discovered to me more clearly what a wretched outcast I was. I cherished hope, it is true, but it vanished when I beheld my person reflected in water or my shadow in the moonshine. Even as that frail image and that inconstant shade, I endeavoured to crush these fears and to fortify myself for the trial which in a few months I resolved to undergo. And sometimes I allowed my thoughts unchecked by reason to ramble in the fields of paradise, and dared to fancy amiable and lovely creatures sympathizing with my feelings and cheering my gloom. Their angelic countenances breathed smiles of consolation, but it was all a dream. No eve soothed my sorrows, nor shared my thoughts. I was alone. I remembered Adam's supplication to his creator. But where was mine? He had abandoned me, and in his bitterness of my heart I cursed him. Autumn passed thus. I saw with surprise and grief the leaves decay and fall and nature again assumed the barren and bleak appearance it had worn when I first beheld the woods and the lovely moon. Yet I did not heed the bleakness of the weather. I was better fitted by my confirmation for the endurance of cold than heat. But my chief delights were the sight of the flowers, the birds, and all the gay apparel of summer. When those deserted me, I turned with more attention to the cottagers. Their happiness was not decreased by the absence of summer. They loved and sympathized with one another, and their joys, depending on each other, were not 
interrupted by the casualties that took place around them. The more I saw of them, the greater became my desire to claim their protection and kindness. My heart yearned to be known and loved by these amiable creatures, to see their sweet looks directed towards me with affection was the utmost limit of my ambition. I dared not think that they would turn them from me with disdain and horror. The poor that stopped at their door were never driven away. I asked, it is true for greater treasures than a little food or rest. I required kindness and sympathy, but I did not believe myself utterly unworthy of it. The winter advanced, and an entire revolution of the seasons had taken place since I awoke into life. My attention at this time was solely directed towards my plan of introducing myself into the cottage of my protectors. I revolved many projects, but that on which I finally fixed was to enter the dwelling when the blind old man should be alone. I had sagacity enough to discover that the unnatural hideousness of my person was the chief object of horror with those who had formerly beheld me. My voice, although harsh, had nothing terrible in it. I thought, therefore, that if in the absence of his children I could gain the good will and meditation of the old de Lacy, I might by his means be tolerated by my younger protectors. One day, when the sun shone on the red leaves that strewed the ground and diffused cheerfulness, although it denied warmth. Safi, Agatha, and Felix departed on a long country walk, and the old man, at his own desire, was left alone in the cottage. When his children had departed, he took up his guitar and played several mournful but sweet airs more sweet and mournful than I had ever heard him play before. At first, his countenance was illuminated with pleasure, but as he continued, thoughtfulness and sadness succeeded. At length, laying aside the instrument, he sat absorbed in reflection. My heart beat quick. This was the hour and moment of trial which would decide my hopes or realize my fears. The servants were gone to a neighboring fair. Wall was silent in and around the cottage. It was an excellent opportunity. Yet when I proceeded to execute my plan, my limbs failed me and I sank to the ground. Again I rose and exerting all the firmness of which I was master, removed the planks which I had placed before my hovel to conceal my retreat. The fresh air revived me and with renewed determination I approached the door of their cottage. I knocked. Who is there? said the old man. Come in. I entered. Pardon this intrusion, said I. I am a traveller in want of a little rest. You would greatly oblige me if you would allow me to remain a few minutes before the fire. Enter, said de Lacy and I will try in what manner I can to relieve your wants, but unfortunately my children are from home, and as I am blind I am afraid I shall find it difficult to procure food for you. Do not trouble yourself, my kind host. I have food. It is warmth and rest only that I want. I sat down, and silence ensued. I knew that every minute was precious to me, yet I remained irresolute in what manner to commence the interview. When the old man addressed me, By your language, stranger, I suppose that you are my countryman. Are you French? No, 
but I was educated by a French family and understand that language only. I am now going to claim the protection of some friends whom I sincerely love and of whose favour I have some hopes. Are they Germans? No, they are French. But let us change the subject. I am an unfortunate and deserted creature. I look around and I have no relation or friend upon earth. These amiable people to whom I go have never seen me and know little of me. I am full of fears, for if I fail there I am an outcast in the world forever. Do not despair. To be friendless is indeed to be unfortunate, but the hearts of men when unprejudiced by any obvious self-interest are full of brotherly love and charity. Rely, therefore, on your hopes, and if these friends are good and amiable, do not despair. They are kind. They are the most excellent creatures in the world, but unfortunately they are prejudiced against me. I have good dispositions. My life has been hitherto harmless and in some degree beneficial. But a fatal prejudice clouds their eyes, and where they ought to see a feeling and kind friend, they behold only a detestable monster. That is indeed unfortunate, but if you are really blameless, cannot you undeceive them? I am about to undertake the task, and it is on that account that I feel so many overwhelming terrors. I tenderly love these friends I have, unknown to them, been for many months in the habits of daily kindness towards them, but they believe that I wish to injure them and it is that prejudice to which I wish to overcome. Where do these friends reside? Near this spot. The old man paused and then continued, If you will unreservedly confide to me the particulars of your tale, I perhaps may be of use in undeceiving them. I am blind and cannot judge of your countenance, but there is something in your words which persuades me that you are sincere. I am poor and an exile, but it will afford me true pleasure to be in any way serviceable to a human creature. Excellent man, I thank you and accept your generous offer. You raise me from the dust by this kindness, and I trust that by your aid I shall not be driven from the society and sympathy of your fellow creatures. Heaven forbid, even if you were really criminal, for that can only drive you to desperation and not instigate you to virtue. I am also unfortunate. I and my family have been condemned, although innocent judge. Therefore, if I do not feel for your misfortunes. How can I thank you, my best and only benefactor? From your lips first have I heard the voice of kindness directed towards me. I shall be forever grateful, and your present humanity assures me of success with those friends whom I am on the point of meeting. May I know the names and residences of those friends? I paused. This, I thought, was the moment of decision which was to rob of or bestow happiness to me forever. I struggled vainly for firmness sufficient to answer him, but the effort destroyed all my remaining strength. I sank on the chair and sobbed aloud. At that moment I heard the steps of my younger protectors. I had not a moment to lose, but seized the hand of the old man I cried. Now is the time. Save and protect me. You and your family are the friends whom I seek. Do not desert me in the hour of trial. Great God, exclaimed the old man, who are you? At that instant the cottage door was opened, and Felix, Safi, and Agatha entered. Who can describe their horror and consternation on beholding me? Agatha fainted, and Safi, unable to attend to her friend, rushed out of the cottage. Felix darted forward, and with supernatural force tore me from his father. 
to whose knees I clung. In a transport of fury, he dashed me to the ground and struck me violently with his stick. I could have torn him limb from limb as the lion rents the antelope, but my heart sunk within me with bitter sickness, and I refrained. I saw him on the point of repeating his blow, when overcome by pain and anguish, I quitted the cottage, and in the general tumult escaped, unperceived, to my hovel. And that is the end of the chapter. A very tragic set of circumstances. If only, perhaps, he had more time alone with De Lacey, the father. Um, perhaps the father would have been able to protect him from the wrath of the fellow family members. It is interesting, I find, that the blind man was perhaps the most generous and merciful because he lacked the ability to be able to judge based on appearance. There's something interesting about that, which I find quite fascinating, as, of course, the creature logically should be treated well. And so, therefore, perhaps the blind man has, ironically, a more perceptive and clearer sight to having an understanding of the creature than those whom can see. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I'll see you for the next chapter and we'll find somewhere else to pause and break and study. Goodbye.